What if the sexual fantasy goes beyond norm? There was a couple from hell, sadistic husband and wife who brutalized young female victims with total domination, forced them into sex slaves to satisfy their eccentric fantasy, and brutally murdered them afterwards. Hello, welcome to Missing Peace. I'm Dr. P. When we think about serial murders, who will come to your mind first? Someone like Mikhail Popkov, who has killed more than 83 women under the society's radar, as we talked about in the previous video? Or Ted Bundy, who leaves mutilated body parts as his peculiar calling card? But uh, most of the time, we don't associate married couples with serial killings. However, couples do commit serial murders. Though such murders have not been common enough so that they can uh, entrench themselves into the public, they have been occurring at some regularity over um, at least the past 30 years. Today we will take a look at a couple of serial killers, Jarrod and Charlene. Jarrod was born on July 17, 1946 in Sacramento, California. His mother was a sex worker and his father was a criminal who became the first man executed in the Mississippi gas chamber for murdering a police officer during his attempt to escape from prison. When Jared was a kid, he was constantly under violence, forced sexual activities and even involved in incest. His uh, unusual childhood later led him to become a criminal. With that, Jared became his criminal career at the age of only 13 when he sexually abused a 6-year-old girl. By the age of 30, he had already gone to prison for more than 10 times due, um, due to various crimes he committed. And eventually, he had 23 arrests prior to his uh, murder spree. He also had a very unstable marriage life. He had failed as a lover and spouse as he has married for a total of 7 times, including 2 marriages to the same woman. He just ran away from them after he ran out of money. So how about Charlene? Charlene was born on October 10th, 1956 in Stockton, um, California, which is near Sacramento, as the only child. Her father Charles was a well-respected entrepreneur who was the vice president for a supermarket chain. He and his wife Mercedes often traveled for business. As a child, um, Charlene was shy but smart. She was gifted and talented with an IQ of 160 and a prodigious talent for the violin. As a reference, Einstein has the IQ of 160. That's how smart Charlene was. However, her mom was badly injured by a car accident which stopped her from traveling with Charles. Charlene took her mother's duty and often traveled with her dad on business trips. She was often praised by her, her father's clients for being intelligent and well-spoken. However, by high school, Charlene started to take drugs and bragged to her friends about a black lover. Predilections for alcohol, drugs, and sex revealed themselves in Charlene's character. She barely graduated from high school, had dropped out of college, and failed marriages, all in a short order. She married a young wealthy man who was a heroin addict. He claimed that she was obsessed with lesbian sex and begged him to have another female while having sex. Failing her first marriage, Charlene married a soldier but divorced shortly after she got bored. Then she had an affair with a married man, but um, their relationship soon ended when she asked if they could have sex with his wife. After breakup, she attempted suicide but uh, survived. Not long after her suicide attempt, she met Jared. How did Jared and Charlene meet and become one of the worst serial killer couple in American history? Jared and Charlene met at a CD poker bar in Sacramento, California in 1977. I thought he was a very nice, clean-cut fellow, Charlene said. Jared found her small stature and blonde hair quite fetching. A few days later, he sent her a dozen roses of a card that read, To a very sweet girl. And within a week of their first encounter, Charlene moved in with Jared. She was the primary breadwinner, um, turning over her earnings from clocking at a supermarket to Jared. 
He even told her what clothes to wear and made no secret of his affair with other women to her. Still, Charlene found Jared quite fascinating as she wanted a man who can take charge and be dominant, much more dynamic than her previous two relationships. She was fascinated by his machismo and was soon sharing in his illicit fantasies. One day, Jared bought a 16-year-old dancer home and they had a f together. Jared wanted to ensure that the two women only interact with him but not each other. However, when he returned home from work, he found them in the bed together. In rage, he threw the girl out of an open window and started hitting Charlene. He then withheld sex from her and said he has become impotent. But in reality, most likely he just found her unattractive because she is not completely dependent on him for sexual pleasure. As previously shared, uh, Charlene enjoys lesbian sex. Shortly after the incident, Jared sodomized his then 14-year-old daughter and her friend, and he did so supposedly with Charlene's knowledge. It was unclear if she was in a room with them at the time, but it was clear that she didn't find anything immoral, which suggests her lack of conscience found in a sociopath. With Jared working as a bartender, Charlene suspected that he has been having an affair with customers coming to the store as he was not interested in her sexuality. Jared even suggested that he needs uh, love slaves to keep him sexually satisfied and Charlene would be the one to procure them. When he spoke of the fantasy of having young disposable sex with well, wait, what is disposable? Anyway. Um, young disposable sex slaves, the idea sounds starkly intriguing and Charlene agreed to lure the teenager victims. After two months of planning, they abducted their first victim on September 11th, 1978, two teenage girls, Rhonda Scheffler and Kippy Bolt. They drove to the Sacramento's Country Club Plaza shopping center in their van, and Charlene located two suitable love slaves and lured them into the band. Rhonda Scheffler, who was 17, and Kippy Bolt, who was 16. They were out shopping and looking for whatever fun they could find. When Charlene approached Ooh. them and offered uh, some pot, it just sounds like the kind of fun that these teenagers were looking for. So they readily followed um, Charlene to the parking lot. When he opened the van, Jarrett was waiting inside the van with a pistol. The girls were surprised, afraid, and easily subdued. Jared then bonded them with tapes and took them away from civilization. After finding a suitable spot in Baxter, California, he raped them and then executed the girls. Both were bludgeoned with a tire iron first and then fatally shot in their heads. After their first murder, Jared and Charlie decided to leave California temporarily until the murder investigations calmed down for a bit. For a while, they had lived a pretty normal life. Jared worked as a driver for a meat distributor, while Charlene worked in the office for another distributor. But by June 1979, he had begun formulating a new plan for new love slaves, and he was eyeing on the Washoe County Fair for his planned execution. On June 24, 1979, Brenda Judd, who was 14, and Sandra Colley, who was 13, were almost out of their fairgrounds and were on the way home when Charlene stopped them. She told them that she needed some help distributing advertising flyers and asked if they are interested in helping her to earn some extra dollars. When the girls agreed, she said that there are some extra, uh, extra, extra flyers in the van that she needed to retrieve. So uh, she led their way to the van. When the three got into the van, Jared once again brandished a gun, bombed the girl, and headed to the hills. On the way to the highway, he stopped at a hardware store, returning to the van with a hammer and shovel. While Charlene was driving, Jared assaulted the girl and forced them into some sexual acts with each other to satisfy his, uh, his fantasy. Once satisfied, he stopped the car, took the girls away from the van, and beat them to death with the shovel and hammer he just bought, and then buried them. Charlene cleaned out the van when they returned to Reno the next day, but uh, Jared decided to keep his hammer and shovel. 
I don't know why, when you want to um, dispose your weapons right away? Interesting. Meanwhile, though Brenda and Sandra has been reported missing, there was some confusion regarding to um, two other girls who were reported missing, but actually rented, um, ended up running away from their family to join a carnival company. Even when this uh, confusion was cleared up, the investigation into the girls' disappearance didn't go far. Feeling recently safe, Jared and Charlene left Reno and returned to Sacramento within a couple of months, and things settled down. Jared found his new sexual intrigue with another woman, but that Charlene was actually, actually relieved uh, because his demand on her now had lessened. Actually, Jared was often impotent when attempting normal sexuality, but in time, the normality with his new conquest wore off and he started to find new excitement. And as a matter of fact, in a lot of crimes with uh, sex as a motif, the criminals are usually only able to gain sexual satisfaction through violence or even murder, as they were not able to get the same sexual excitement from normal sexuality. On April 24, 1980, Stacy N. Radican and Karen Tweet were both 17 and worldly girls. However, they were not wise enough to realize that an offer Charlene made to them with free drugs and a ride in a cool van would lead to their deaths. Even when Jared pointed a gun at them, they seemed more inquisitive than frightened. They thought um, this situation was some sort of grown-up game and they, sh they should have been uh, playing along with. Both were sexually abused and then murdered with a hammer. Charlene, who had an abortion the previous year, was once again pregnant. She steeled himself for directions from Jared, expecting the worst, and was shocked when he was rather pleased with her pregnancy. The idea of creating life fed his enormous egos, and besides, the necessity provides an excellent cover for his true depra depravity. He even went to marry Charlene once again, using his Stephen Fail alias, which is actually Charlene's cousin's name. Feeling that his new marriage would help to cement his new identity and further hide his old one, Jared breathed easy and he's ready to take more risks. It was June 7, 1980. Jared found Linda Acura, a four months pregnant, walking beside the highway. Though she wasn't his type, he decided that he had to have her. He offered her a free ride and got her into the van. Charlene knew the routine as Jared ordered her to drive and started um, his sexual assault. He struck her with a rock, strangled and buried the life, and left her for dead. The authorities first suspected her boyfriend for the killing because he had beaten Linda before and the circumstantial evidence against her boyfriend weighted heavily, though one witness reported seeing a pregnant lady getting to the van on the day Linda went missing. It only took a month and a half that Jared was ready for another one. He was getting bolder and becoming more and more impatient. On the day of July 17, 1980, he adopted Virginia Michelle, who was uh, 34, and he and was the bartender at the Sale Inn. They headed to home instead of the countryside as usual. Charlene was watching TV while uh, waiting for Jared to um, rape Virginia. He strangled Virginia with a fishing cord and then dumped the body uh, outside Clarksburg. It was not long enough before Jared announced his intentions of capturing more love slaves once again. On November 1st, 1980, Jared and Charlene drove to um, a shopping mall where Jared scanned clouds for um, pendulates. It took a while and Charlene started to give up um, for the night and head home. But on early in the morning of November 2nd, Jared ordered her to stop her car at the Arden Fair, which is a popular shopping center. She was shocked to see that the victims this time were not two young females, but rather a man and a woman who were probably college students. While leaving a fraternity party, Craig Miller, who was 22, and his fiancée, Mary Sauer, who was 21, were forced into the van at a gunpoint. 
Hoping their consents would keep them safe, they compiled. They even kept quiet when a fraternity friend of Craig's, who attended the same dinner party that night,、uh, saw the couple leaving, leaned into the car and asked what they were doing. Just then, Charlene began to shout at the at that friend and pulled away quickly. But not quickly enough, though. The friend、uh, wrote down the license plate of the van as it was、um, driving away. Craig、um, was ordered out of the car and shot. He was shot three times in the head, and his body was found near the Bass Lake in California. They returned to their apartment with Mary, where Gerard sexually abused her before before taking her to the countryside, where he executed her. When Gerard and Charlene returned to Charlene's parents' home the next day, police were already waiting for them. Gerard ran away, leaving Charlene to answer the investigators' questions. Without any definite evidence at that time, the detective left、um, Charlene's home with with deep suspicion on this couple. Almost caught, they decided to flee and board the bus to the Salt Lake City. Later back in Sacramento, Craig's fraternity brother identified a picture of Gerard as the man he saw in the van with Craig and Mary. Now the evidence are mounting against Gerard and Charlene. Feared Charles, who is、uh, Charlene's father, revealed that Stephen Fayol's real name is Gerard Galaco. Meanwhile, at Salt Lake City, Charlene called her parents to ask for money, which they wired to her. She and Gerard moved on to Denver and then to Omaha, where he once she once again asked、uh, her parents for money. This time, Charles told the FBI. What they were doing and where they are. With the information, the agents were able to track them down and arrest Jared and Charlene at a Western Union office. Jared and Charlene plead not guilty to the charges of kidnapping and murder. However, Charlene struck the deal. It took a while for Charlene's attorney to eventually convince、um, the、uh, prosecutors in several states and county to allow Charlene to testify against Jared. For a plea deal, which would reduce her sentence to 16 years and eight months. In June 1983, Jared was found guilty. In June 1984, in less than four hours, Jared was found guilty of murder in the case of Karen and Stacy. He was subsequently sentenced to death. However, Jared died of cancer on July 18, 2002. In the Veda Prison Medical Center while awaiting execution. Meanwhile, Charlene completed her sentence and was released in July 1997. During an interview, Charlene claimed that she was also one of the victims. When she said, "There were victims who died and there were victims who lived," it took me a hell of a long time to realize that I was one of the ones who lived. She also claimed that she tried to save some lives. Depending on whose stories you believe in, Charlene Glecko was either a reluctant facilitator or a willing participant in her husband Jared's tragic extended binge. After the couple's apprehension, Charlene claimed that Jared had bitten and intimidated her into helping him, but Jared, for his part, insisted that he has taken part in the assaults and killings. We had the sexual fantasy, see, so we just carried it out. Charlene later recounted chillingly, "I mean, like it was easy and fun, and we really enjoyed it. So why shouldn't we do it?" It was clear that both Charlene and Jared were psychopaths. Actually, I'm leaning more towards that Charlene actually enjoyed the killing part. She was not innocent at all. But I also have one more question: If Charlene enjoyed lesbian sex, why did she marry to men? Why would she want a dominant male figure in her marriage? This is the end of our story today. Please let me know if you enjoyed the video by hitting the like button and comments below. Also, please don't forget to subscribe to Missing Piece for weekly mysteries and crime stories. See you next time.